Hey friends, Sarah here again. Um, I wanted to do a video about sequence switches because they're really interesting and it's not something I've gone into a great amount of detail about. Now the funny thing about sequence switches is that they were really hard for me to understand when I was first learning panel. It's, it's not that, you know, I don't know. It's just something that I couldn't wrap my head around for some reason until one day it clicked. You might have a different experience than me. It might be really easy for you and just come naturally, or it might just cause you to ask more questions like it did for me. Um, this video is going to be somewhat off the cuff because I found that I'm kind of a perfectionist. And if I go into editing software and, and start messing with things, then what inevitably happens is that I never release uh, any videos because I just am never happy with the result. So I'm going to just try to do this in as few takes as possible and just put it out there um, instead of doing what I normally do and ending up with a pile of really awesome videos that never get released because I'm not as perfect as I want to be. So let's talk about sequence switches. These are a really important concept in the panel switch and the key to unlocking a lot of other understanding. Um, the thing about sequence switches in the panel is that they are everywhere. Every frame almost has one. They're uh, here and here and here. Got some here. Whole bunch of them here. Got some way down here and way up here. There's some more way down here and some on this frame here. So what do sequence switches do? Well, three basic things. Number one, they're finite state machines. And uh, there's a r couple of really great videos on YouTube about that. And I'll go into a little bit, but if you want to know more, I'll put some links down there in the description. Second thing, they're multi-contact relays. So they're used for connecting lots of wires from one circuit to lots of wires from another circuit. And then three, finally, they're used for outpulsing signals to other switches in certain cases. So the engineers of the panel system really found ways to use them whenever possible. One of the most interesting ways they're used is uh, as finite state machines. So what is a finite state machine? This is a really simple way of taking an input and moving in a linear, predictable fashion through different states to get you to a desired outcome. Now, those states can also kind of encode almost like a very simple memory. Because when you're in a state, what you're really doing is you're rearranging the circuit to perform in a predictable, specific way in that state and only in that state. In that way, that can be used as a very basic memory. Now, it usually doesn't handle advanced concepts like integers and variables. It's just a, a state memory. So what am I doing right now? And how can I interact with my inputs and my outputs to get me to the next place? Um, it's really cool. So where did this come from? The panel switch was being designed at sort of the middle end of the Industrial Revolution. And in that time period, they really understood automata, or automatons. And they understood that with things like gears and cams, you could change the behavior of a machine uh, to do whatever you wanted to do based on your inputs. Think about the Jacquard loom, which maybe didn't use gears and cams, it used punch cards, but it's the same uh, the same concept. Think about Babbage's difference engine. Same concept. They used cams and gears to give you an output based on user input. And then even think up to World War II where they had uh, mechanical firing computers. So you can, for your ballistic trajectories, you could input something into this mechanical computer using sliders and levers and stuff and then run the computer through mechanically and its output would be uh, some information regarding the, you know, the logarithm or the arc um, and the angle at which you fired it and the speed at which it fired and the wind speed and all these different things. 
this could all be done just with simple machines using the concept of finite state machines. So how do they work in panel? Well, this is a district frame. It's similar to the other types of selector uh, frames here in the panel office, and I could use it to explain state machines to you or the sequence switches. So on this side of the district frame, we have 30 vertical selectors. There's also 30 on the other side for a total of 60. So each of these vertical selectors has a permanently associated with it one sequence switch. Each sequence switch can rotate to any one of 18 possible positions, and each of those positions is one state. The sequence switches can only rotate in the forward direction. They can never rotate backwards. So if it wants to get from position two all the way back to position one, it has to move through the other remaining positions to get back to position one. I'm going to rotate one now uh, manually by hand just so you can see what it looks like. So that was one full rotation. Because this state machine is currently in the normal position, it's configured in such a way that it's waiting for some action to happen. It's waiting to be seized. And if I take it off normal in this position, if I move it to position two, it's wired in such a way that it will always revolve around to position one because the rest of the system is not uh, in a condition where it's going to do anything useful. So the way that sequence switches work is they're driven by this rotating vertical shaft. If we look at this spinning vertical shaft, we see we've got the shaft, the drive disk, the magnet, and the driven disk of the sequence switch itself. Now what happens when the sequence switch is about to move is the magnet becomes engaged by uh, current going through it. Now the business end of the magnet is this pole piece right down here that's, that's just a millimeter away from the spinning uh, disc. What happens is this disc becomes magnetized, which causes this disc to get pulled in towards it. And when that happens, they're driven by friction. Lined up along the top of the sequence switch are a, a multiple of springs that engage with the cams. Now the cams have cuttings on them, and those cuttings uh, cause the cam to either, you know, part of the cam to either be conductive or non-conductive. And as the sequence switch rotates through its various 18 positions, each cutting on the cam will either be passing over a uh, a pickup spring, or it will not be. And that is what serves to close and open the circuits that the sequence switch controls. That also serves to determine whether or not the sequence switch is going to stay put in where it's at, or whether or not it's going to actually advance. And in the slow-mo section here, you can actually see the cams moving over the uh, springs, and you can see the circuits opening and closing. Now the cutting of those cams and, and how they're laid out is what defines the behavior of the sequence switch and the finite state machine. There's even a tiny clockwork version of the sequence switch here in this test box. This is a portable test box that would be carried around the office. And uh, since they didn't want to have to have a motor in here driving the sequence switch, there's actually a crank on the, on the outside of the box on the right side. And if you crank it up, this clockwork mechanism here will kick the sequence switch into action once you release the relay. Isn't that wild?
for you nerds out there, I've also made a state transition diagram of the sequence switch on the frame I was just talking about. So uh, I'll put a link to it down in the description and you'll be able to down a larger PDF or JPEG or whatever of it. Um, but this is the start state and the end state. And you can see the progression of the different states it could be in depending on different inputs. Now I think sequence switches are super cool. But they were eventually phased out once AT&T realized how much of a pain they were to work on. Right here next to me are all of the tools that you need to fully work on the sequence switch and its associated shaft and driving disk. I've done a lot of this work on the various frames in the panel office, and it is time consuming. Um, I can't imagine how many man hours it, they spent just adjusting sequence switches into the infinitesimally um, exacting uh, specifications they had to be in, but I'm sure it was a lot. So the money they saved on circuit complexity, um, they probably burned all that away in uh, time it took to actually fix anything. Now, <clears throat> adjusting and repairing sequence switches is an operation that has a very, very specific order. And I've learned the hard way that if you do it backwards or you skip a step and say, I'll get back to that later, you're gonna throw the whole thing out of the, you know, out of whack. Because every adjustment ends up being relative to every adjustment before it. So that means you have to get the vertical shaft true in its bearings before you make any adjustment on the switches or their frameworks at all. So the first step is to use these tools to get the vertical shaft uh, running true uh, in the bearings. That's why you have the string and uh, these guys here. There's a plumb bob somewhere. I don't remember what I did with it. Um, <clears throat> and that's all to find while the uh, vertical shaft is spinning, is it spinning out of line left or right, front or back, or anything out of alignment. So that's a big deal. So once you get all that done, then you can move on to the sequence switch. But don't forget, if you've got a bad drive disk, you have to take the whole shaft out and pull all of the drive disks off the shaft from the bottom or the top, replace that disk, and put all the disks back on. And then these tools back here are for working on the actual sequence switch itself. And um, again, the order of operations is really important. I actually... Uh, you know, I should have known better than to make this mistake, but I was working on the sender frame a few months ago, and I started just to adjust, you know, a sequence switch somewhere in the middle, and then I realized that the whole vertical shaft was out of alignment. And when I did, I started aligning the vertical shaft, and when I got the vertical shaft into proper alignment, all of the sequence switches stopped working because they were all adjusted for the vertical shaft when it was out of alignment and now that it was in, nothing worked. So then I had to take the entire assembly apart and re rebuild it and do each adjustment uh, one after the other and it was very time consuming. It probably took me, uh, you know, eight to 10 solid hours of work. It really amazes me to think about all of the custom tools that Western Electric had to create and fashion just to work on sequence switches because none of these, maybe with the exception of this, are, are stock tools. Well, this, you know, the hand mirror, the dental mirror, and the screwdriver are stock tools, but literally everything else you see here has been specially made by Western Electric for just working on sequence switches. Um, and there are other tools for working on other parts of the machine and that are equally as varied and complex. It's really incredible to me the amount of craftsmanship that went into this.